By now, most of you have heard that an NFT painting has sold for more than $69 million. This is, of course, a humongous amount of money for what is basically a digital painting that anyone can see on the internet. Yes, that's true. You can see it online without paying that $69 million. Here it is, in fact. Turns out, he didn't even make a new artwork. He just made a collage of all his existing artworks. Probably used the free version of Photoshop Mobile, too. He is not even the only one. Remember Neon Cat? Or, since it's supposed to be onomatopic, maybe I should call it Neon Cat. Probably the most famous internet gif of the last 10 years. The creator of that one just sold a non-fungible token, NFT, of a slightly modified version for more than $550,000. Sorry, I just can't stop staring at this gif. This brings us to the question of what exactly is a non-fungible token? Is it safe? And is my FOMO justified? But to answer that, let's first take a quick, and yes, I promise it'll be a very quick look at what a blockchain is. Remember ledgers? The massive registers where accountants stored all their data entries. They came with a bunch of inherent risks. Firstly, it's stored in one place, obviously. So you need to back up the entries in the ledger in case you lose the original. And how do you back up a physical register? Secondly, what if someone modifies it? How do you verify the validity of the data in the ledger? And if it's been tampered, how can you tell who did the tampering? Ledgers moved online many years ago into databases. The internet is pretty much powered by databases now. Databases for websites, for storing credit card information, your shipping address and preferred delivery time, mostly everything. However, databases do have one issue. They are controlled by one of the parties involved. Your bank account database is stored on the bank's side, so if the bank wants to make a change to an entry, it can. You can, of course, then go back and check your old emails and statements and dispute it. But the point remains, if they want to change it, they can. Which brings us to the blockchain. To put it very simply, a blockchain is a distributed ledger that is simultaneously stored on thousands of computers across the world. It literally consists of blocks of data on a chain that keeps growing over time as more blocks of data are added. Each block consists of a series of transactions that could be unrelated and could be happening anywhere in the world. These blocks are then verified by a large group of unrelated computers on that particular blockchain network. Since it's distributed, in the sense that the blocks are replicated across a large group of computers, it's pretty much impossible to bend the system. You'd have to modify the data across all the computers currently holding a copy of that data. The blockchain has a lot of uses, including one that you've definitely heard of. Cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. New Bitcoins are created through a process called mining. And then Bitcoin sale and purchase transactions are recorded on the blockchain. The process of mining new Bitcoins involves solving complex math problems. The first person, or rather the first computer that solves the problem, is awarded new Bitcoins. This process has set up some very weird incentives. People have set up massive farms of computers that do nothing but solve math problems so that they can earn new Bitcoins and Ethereum. This has led to things such as massive global graphic card shortages. And of course, as you can imagine, this is a very energy intensive process. And we'll get into that later. Meanwhile, people are working on very many other use cases for blockchain. Disintermediating stock markets for one, file storage on the cloud for another. But let's finally, finally get down to our topic of interest, non-fungible tokens. Now the main reason currencies are so useful in buying and selling goods is because they're fungible, which means that they're replaceable or tradable for something else of the same type or value. Thanks, Cambridge Dictionary. Exchange a 100 rupee note for another 100 rupee note and you haven't gained or lost anything. They're both the same for all functional and practical purposes. Books are fungible too. One new copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide that you buy for $15 is the same as another new copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide. Except, what if you had a copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide that was signed by Douglas Adams himself? Suddenly, it's worth much more than $15. How much more? There's no one answer. Some people will value it more than others. It's a limited edition after all. And that's where non-fungible tokens come in. So far, collectibles were mostly physical because digital items are infinitely replicable. You could buy the Beatles' White Album on Amazon for 18 dollars 
and so can anyone else. In fact, if you have the MP3 version, you can give a copy of that album to a friend and now you both have a copy of the album. But what if you had a copy that was digitally signed by this man? Suddenly it's worth much more than 18.99 and it's now become a one of a kind. This is where non-fungible tokens come in. They've essentially brought the concept of limited editions to digital art. And this could be any kind of digital item. Lindsay Lohan sold an image of her face for $50,000. William Shatner, Captain James Tiberius Kirk himself, has sold William Shatner themed trading cards, which were basically photos and images of his personal life, including I kid you not, an x-ray of his teeth. 10,000 of these packs sold out in 9 minutes. Meanwhile, Jack Dorsey sold a token of his first tweet ever for $2.9 million. Yes, you can still see that tweet online for free, but that won't be digitally signed by Dorsey. So who owns the rights? And if you're buying an NFT, what exactly are you buying? As Mike Shinoda, yes, he of Linkin Park fame, puts it, if you buy an MP3 of a song as an NFT, you don't own the song. It's the equivalent of buying a print of a piece of artwork or buying an original piece of artwork. Just because you buy a print of Mickey Mouse doesn't mean that you get to put Mickey Mouse on everything. And yes, you don't get to own the copyright to Mickey Mouse. So basically, you're buying one specific copy that's been signed by the artist. Just that the signature is digital. So in this case, someone decided that Jack Dorsey's digital signature linked to that tweet is worth $2.9 million. Which brings us to a rather important question. Why? Why pay so much for something that isn't unique? It's a good question. Let's get back to the digital artwork sold by people for $69 million. I seem to be using that number a lot. You can see it online for free, download it, set it as your wallpaper. Why would someone pay $69 million for it? But that's exactly how art works. I could check out the Scream online, download a high-res version, print it out and frame it on my wall. That didn't stop another version painted by Munch from being auctioned for $120 million in 2012. Why did someone pay that much for it? Bragging rights? Potential investment value? I have no way to answer the question. In either case, the tech community sensed a gap and tried to bring the same artificial scarcity that exists in the real world to the digital world. Naturally, they make a commission on every sale and every resale. So the incentives to create NFTs aren't all that difficult to decipher. And given their popularity, they aren't going away anytime soon. Which brings us to the obvious problems. For one, there's a new technology that lends itself to FOMO and only exists to create artificial scarcity. So can the scammers be far behind? Scammers have successfully set up verified profiles pretending to be famous artists. So they're selling digitally signed artwork that belongs to someone else and making a lot of money on it. Listen, if someone wants to pay me a thousand dollars for a Mick Jagger poster that was signed by me, I won't say no. Artists are being informed by their fans that their artwork is being found on all kinds of NFT sites. And speaking of NFT sites, there are now NFT sites that are scamming and pretending to be other NFT sites. Yes, there are replica NFT sites. And that's by far not even the biggest problem with the NFT pad. Remember how validation is done on the blockchain? by getting computers and massive computer farms to solve math problems. Now all that computational power being used requires really fast processors and a whole lot of electricity. You could see it as converting electricity into new cash and then using a lot more electricity to constantly verify all the tokens being added. Most NFT marketplaces use a cryptocurrency called Ethereum. Ethereum is built on a system called Proof of Work. As The Verge puts it, Proof of work acts as a sort of security system for cryptocurrencies since there's no third party like a bank that oversees transactions. To keep financial records secure, the system forces people to solve complex puzzles using energy guzzling machines. You solve the puzzles, you add a new block of verified transactions to the blockchain and you get paid in the form of new tokens. So this process is incredibly energy inefficient on purpose. As a result, Ethereum alone uses about as much electricity as the entire country of Libya. And it's growing. As the interest in NFTs has risen sharply over the last couple of months, so has Ethereum energy usage. It's basically tripled in the last four months alone. How serious is this energy consumption in real terms? Well, one single NFT transaction 
has the same carbon footprint as more than 69,000 credit card transactions. There's that number again. Or watching 5,000 hours of YouTube. Yes, that's for one transaction. The average NFT, according to a now defunct NFT analysis site called CryptoArt, has a carbon footprint similar to an average EU resident's electricity usage for three weeks. Are there alternatives? Yes. Ethereum is hoping to switch to a system called Proof of Stake instead of the current Proof of Work. This will involve far fewer users doing the verifications and each validator's physical location will be known. They'll also have to put up some of their own coins as collateral in case they're found cheating. This should theoretically reduce energy usage per transaction by more than 99%. However, this also takes away the decentralized and anonymous nature of the blockchain. So is MasterCard really all that different? So that's what NFTs are in very, very, very brief. If you like this video, think of ways to pressure large corporations to drastically reduce their carbon footprints. Our bamboo straws aren't going to make one inch of difference compared to all the plastic that's currently filling our supermarkets and hence our oceans.